Welcome. I am Dr. Daryl Ezell, Director of the MA in Interfaith Action Program and Center for the Study of Religion, Culture, and Foreign Affairs here at Claremont Lincoln University. Thank you for joining us today for our roundtable discussion on Building Bridges, Race, Leadership, and Social Justice. Today's discussion will focus on the impact of racism in America and the importance of learning how to build bridges to promote harmony and community engagement. Talking about race in America is not always easy, but CLU is committed to hosting mindful discussions that yield recommendations on how to work collaboratively to promote social change. The first step to having a conversation about race in America is acknowledging that prejudice and racial injustice exist. We've noticed this over the last few years with minority and religious communities voicing their public discontent towards racial injustice and prejudice in the public sphere. According to a 2014 Brookings Institute report on America's changing demographic, demographer and senior fellow William Frey reports that the United States is on a trajectory to become a majority minority nation by the year 2044. As this nation transitions, it will be forced to confront its long history of prejudice and structural racism, leaving community leaders and practitioners to learn new skills to interact and build relations across divisions of race and culture. We have an extraordinary panel with us today to explore these issues and how practitioners and community leaders can work together. Joining us in the studio, we have Dr. Anita Leffel, Director for the MA in Social Impact Program here at Claremont Lincoln University. Thank you. Dr. Victor Manalo, who is the Director of the Claremont Corps. And joining us via satellite uh, today, we have Dr. Stan Ward, who is the Interim Director for the MA in Ethical Leadership Program at CLU. And Reverend Will McGarvey, who is a faculty member in the MA and Interfaith Action Program and also the Executive Director of the Interfaith Council on Costa, Contra Costa uh, County in the Bay Area. I'd like to start off our discussion uh, today by exploring race relations in the U.S. I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. Uh, Will, in your view, are race relations in the U.S. getting better or worse? Feel free to point to a few examples. I think that they're getting both better and worse. I've seen some seminaries that are sending immersion teams to places like Ferguson. I've also seen Chicago Theological Seminary make a video on white privileged glasses as a new way of trying to think about how white people hold privilege and carry that in our society. I've seen some congregations going deeper into conversation with themselves. But if you don't have a community to go deeper with, it's not happening. Well, you know, you write and teach about interracial and interreligious relations and the impact of power and privilege in society. How has structural racism in particular contributed to many systemic problems and factors that we see in society today? Yes, our nation has had a system of laws and housing policy that have disenfranchised African Americans from many different housing programs, even for returning World War II veterans, that has systematically affected the ability of black households to accrue wealth and house instability. There were sundown laws in many white neighborhoods until they were made illegal with the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Thereafter, there continued to be some communities that had implicit policies of exclusionary housing, where realtors enforced by not showing housing to African American families or other people of color until there was a crackdown on the practice. Then we saw affluent cities starting to use exclusionary housing policies to increase lot size and standardize a more expensive form of suburban development aimed at retaining housing values to make it harder for low-wage families without significant wealth assets to move in. So while this is one example of 
racism as white families moved out of historically urban areas and metropolitan areas. They left behind communities of color with less historic reinvestment in the infrastructure and aging houses. And so a new form of segregation, what we now call economic segregation, started to show up in formerly white working class cities like Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, and Detroit, Michigan. In fact, there's an eight mile circle wide ring around downtown Detroit that has been left by such families. I think that this is what Black Lives Matter has exposed in our society, but they've done it from a grassroots level. And what they've exposed is the level of disinvestment such communities have experienced at the same time with the growingly militarized police that uses more aggressive tactics to control such communities where jobs become scarce and crime has increased. Many of these are forgotten communities by the white communities where some sectors of society have blamed the victims for their plight. One of the interesting things that came out of last term's religion in the public sphere course here at CLU was seeing the number of black church religious leaders who have come out against the Black Lives Matter movement perhaps because they view themselves as the primary leaders of the civil rights movement and the inheritors of that leadership. And watching this more grassroots movement come out of the community itself, including female leadership from the queer community that, that are now pointing out historic wrongs that they've experienced from leaders in the black church. They've also been pointing out other intersections to their plight, such as the rise of militarization of police in America, having occurred after police chiefs in Ferguson and Baltimore have made trips to be trained in people control tactics by some companies in Israel who offer their experience controlling Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. So by pointing out these intersections of oppression, they're placing their movement into conversation with those around the world who experience similar oppressions, and then finding solidarity with many others around the country who experience police violence, say, in LA or in Oakland, Cleveland, or other places around the country. So to understand the historic oppressions that various communities experience, we need to understand a certain level of cultural competency to rebuild the bridges needed in American society. This is a good point you make, Will. You uh, decided to take a, a very deep dive, which is good, because you had a chance to unpack structural racism and how it's linked to a number of injustices, whether, you know, with respect to fair trade, not fair trade, but fair housing, uh, issues around uh, police brutality. Anita, what can you add to this discussion in terms of the current social impact that racism and racial uh, injustice has on a society and most importantly institutions? Well, Will has made a couple of good points and let me give you a, a different perspective on it. If you take a look at former leaders, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King, Rachel Carson, those movements were their leadership. We know who they were and we know what they were accomplishing. We now see leaderless movements going on, the Arab Spring and Occupy uh, Wall Street. Uh, some of the other things that um, Will was mentioning has to do with what we call post-intentional racism. This was coined by a Princeton University uh, professor who said that it doesn't have to be blatant discrimination to legitimize racism. We know that it exists. And he, Will also mentioned Ferguson. And of course, the Ferguson Committee report had a call for action, four different calls for action regarding their community. A number of the communities around the country are establishing and submitting these reports for a call for action. But it's not happening. It's not happening enough. Uh, a McKinsey report most recently told us that there are over one million nonprofit organizations that are addressing a variety of issues, uh, and particularly uh, racism. And it accounts for $837 billion of products and services. And yet, this same report states that many of these leaders of these nonprofit organizations are feeling overwhelmed and underprepared. 
And if they happen to be the ones who are prepared, their staff, their, their managers, the individuals that they work with are not prepared. Mm -hmm. And part of what McKinsey reported was that the team wasn't ready, they were not talented, they were, did not know how to collaborate, they did not know how to manage for outcomes. And here at Claremont Lincoln University, we are looking at these issues and we're, we've decided, we've stated in our own objectives that we require a new way of leading. I want to go back to this call of action. Why are leaders, community leaders, are you referring to community leaders, institutional leaders, why are they afraid to implement this call of action? Well, I, I don't believe that it, they're afraid. I believe that they're not trained. They're not well uh, uh, capable, I should say, of collaborating. And it, collaboration is a very difficult thing. And you know, we start with teaching dialogue before we start talk, talk about collaboration. And dialogue is a, extremely important. It's the first step of which many of these organizations are not doing. Not to say that there aren't some really great things going on in our country to address some of these social issues and particularly racism, mm. but certainly not enough. Victor, I, I want to turn to you and, and ask a question around mindfulness. You are the director of the Claremont Corps. We uh, teach and we talk a lot about mindfulness. What is needed today to ensure that a mindful approach is taken to address these issues, especially at the civic level? Right. Well, you know, Daryl, in my experience uh, as an elected official, mm -hmm. been elected since 2007 in my city of Artesia, um, I, I've come to understand the importance of mindfulness uh, as a public official. Right. And uh, people have elected me to do a certain task, mm -hmm. uh, but I have uh, come to be, uh, to understand my role um, and increase my understanding of my role as a representative and as a person who has the ability to bring people together and to create uh, different opportunities for people to engage. Um, I think the, one of the points that Anita made is, is very important in that uh, a government, for example, could, or an institution could put out a call to action, but if people are not ready to hear that call, or they're not prepared or trained to receive that call and to actually act, uh, people are not going to act. And, and so I think it's incumbent upon institutions and government at all levels uh, to create spaces for collaboration, to create spaces for dialogue. And that does not exist in my experience. Mm -hmm. We have council meetings that are open to the public, but people don't show up to the meetings unless they have something to complain about. And uh, that's part of my job and I understand that, but it's not a very productive way of, of problem solving or of coming up with solutions to some of the problems that we've already addressed, like Will has mentioned, regarding to housing policy, to law enforcement and the community's relationship to law enforcement. These are all issues that are most felt at the local levels. And we definitely need some space for people to come together and not just, and to have some dialogue and collaboration around some of these issues. So would you agree that the real conversation, the nitty gritty really takes place at the local level, whether it's the town hall, whether it's you know community organizations and community groups working together? Absolutely, I think the the spaces have to cre be created at the local level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the one, the great thing about what we're trying to do here at Claremont Lincoln University is that everyone that comes through this program is going to be going out and practicing in their own neighborhoods and communities where they live and where they work. And so it definitely, that's, that's the heritage of our democracy here, Daryl, uh, as we talked about the Declaration of Independence right. was had to be ratified within each of the states at the local levels before they made that the they made that Declaration of Independence, and so we have that heritage in our democracy. It needs to start at the local level, and uh, that's what we're we're trying to do here. I totally agree that feedback loop is extremely important to move from local level to state officials to state officials. 
back down to the local level. Uh, I want to stay on the local level and, uh, and move and turn the page to local engagement and social justice at the local level. Will, between uh, 2013 and 2015, we witnessed several public protests denouncing racially motivated hate crimes and also the killing of unarmed blacks by police or security officials. Some of the notable deaths uh, include Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Sandra Bland, and 12-year-old uh, Tamir Rice. How has social media and new international activist movements like Black Lives Matter uh, brought attention to race, police brutality, and most importantly, the need to promote social justice? Well, our mobile technology has been able to help expose the times when police brutality has taken the lives of those that they serve. They've also been a great tool for showing the great things that police departments that are using community policing are doing to be benefited in their, in their local area. Social media has helped to share those messages faster than in any other time in human history. What used to get rare coverage in the media is shared by individuals instantly now. And when the pattern has shown that violence against young men and women is much more prevalent than we hoped, it's much easier for that message to get out. And this might be why there are less singular leaders of such moments and movements. While we've been waiting for the next Dr. King or the next God, the grassroots leaders are working together across greater differences than at any time before to make the connection between what's going on in Cleveland and LA and even what's going on right in Richmond, California with the community policing. It was within seconds after the, the police chief a white man, a white gay man that had Black Lives Matter sign that it was all over social media and the people of Richmond, California were sharing their support for his work and for all that he had done to be able to decrease violent crime within his region here in the Bay Area. I think we also see faith communities starting to come together to really try to address poverty and one of the things we're seeing in our county is we're seeing people from congregations that are tired of dealing with the symptoms of poverty, the homelessness, the, the hunger, need, many of the different issues that show up. And, and we've now organized six different committees, including one on racial justice, to be able to work towards helping the returning citizens coming back out of the state prison, getting light into housing and into the programs that are here, addressing the housing shortage that we have, also addressing the, the living wage needs that we have here in the Bay Area because of the high cost of living. And social media has helped to a degree to be able to mobilize those folks, but mostly it's been a faith community response to being tired of being, being the community of last resort to picking up the pieces for many of these problems in society. Very good point. Uh, a number of these new media movements or digital uh, movements that we're seeing, uh, not only in the US, but around the world uh, with uh, the Arab Spring and what's taking place uh, in parts of Europe as well around trade movements and things of that nature, we notice that they're leaderless, leaderless in a sense. But with that said, Stan, I want to turn to you and ask uh, a little bit about ethical principles. You write and teach a lot about uh, ethical leadership. Uh, speak to us about how organizations and communities in particular, these communities that are coming together, that are converging together, might organize and apply ethical principles uh, when promoting, and, uh, promoting social justice and fighting against racial injustice. Thanks. I, I think one of the most basic tests we get from a man named Robert Greenlee, who created a model for servant leadership. And he says one of the tests for servant leadership, and again, I think this is a helpful test for ethical leadership, especially related to social justice, is to ask ourselves, what is the effect of our leadership on the least privileged of society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? And so some of the examples we had earlier, especially the, the housing illustration that Will gave at the beginning of our conversation, clearly fails that test. So the question then becomes for community leaders, so what do we do when we, we see something fail this test for ethical leadership? There's an organization called ProSci that specializes in change management or change leadership, and they've got a very helpful 
change model that begins with two factors, awareness and desire. So in other words, if you don't have awareness, um, you're not gonna have desire. And if you don't have desire, you're not gonna take the action steps to make change. So one of the things that leaders need to ask themselves, community leaders need to ask themselves is, how do we make other people aware of this, this gap in our society? And I think that's one of the reasons that social media has been so effective. And I think that's also one of the reasons that storytelling is catching on as a leadership tool because it helps make people aware. And then the next thing for community leaders becomes, how do we build desire to make change? But it's not just limited to community leaders. Because I'm interested in leadership studies, I'm interested in both for-profit and nonprofit settings. And so I would encourage business leaders, individuals, to ask themselves, okay, how aware am I of the impact of my policy, procedures, or products on the least privileged of society? And as I become aware of discrepancy, what do I desire to do about it? You make a great point, Stan. Uh, I, I want to stay right there for a second. Uh, as you talk about uh, leaders being aware that other exist, how do we make sure that we're able to close the, the trust deficit? Because in most of these communities, no. there's a gap that's present between leadership uh, and activists, uh, between leadership and community groups. So how do we close this deficit today? What's needed? I think consistency is part of it. I know there's a lot of social science that looks at why followers fail to trust their leaders or why that trust is broken. One of them is simply a lack of consistency. In other words, saying I value X, but I'm practicing Y. And so I encourage leaders when they talk about their value, or in this case, social justice, one of the tests becomes what stories am I able to share about what I'm doing that demonstrate a willingness to make sacrifices for that value? And when I show the willingness to make sacrifices for a value, I'm building trust. That's a good point. Victor, I want to turn to you. Um, let's think about civic diplomacy and how uh, social engagement between uh, community engagement between civic leaders and community organizers is changing, it's shifting, the dynamic is not the same anymore. We have to listen now uh, before we implement dialogue and collaboration uh, with one another. So what approach uh, should civic officials consider when engaging community organizers and activists today? Right. That's a great question, Daryl. And uh, I was uh, honored to be, be able to attend the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Washington, D.C. last month. And one of my big takeaways from that conference was that uh, government at all levels, but specifically at the local levels, that we have a power to convene. And uh, outside of our normal council meetings. So everyone knows about council meetings and, and it's, a, it's a public meeting and anyone can attend. But we have the power to bring people together, whether they are community activists, community organizations, or institutions, nonprofits across different sectors of the population. Bring them together. And there's very innovative work being done in many localities throughout the United States that are using their power to convene people, not from a top down approach right. saying, okay, we're bringing you together because we we have decisions to make and we just kind of want your input right. on things. But no, but really reaching out to people and saying, we want a vision for our city for the next 15 years. We want, we want you to participate in a collaborative governance of self-governance. And that's, that's part of my dismay of being an elected city, council, uh, city councilman for the last uh, eight years or so, is that we've somehow abdicated our responsibility for governance to the people that we've elected. Mm. And we leave that responsibility to our elected officials. And uh, of course, I feel like I'm doing a good job as an elected <laughs> official, but I think that uh, our 
government would come up with much better policies that would serve the needs of the constituents if the constituents were engaged in that collaborative process. So there are local governments that are doing things like study circles mm. where they invite people to uh, a public meeting, they break up people into groups, and they say, uh, ask big questions like, what, what kinds of, uh, there are cities that have said, we wanna, we wanna protect our, our parkland, our open spaces, or we wanna improve our relationship with, with our police department or we want to determine what our downtown is gonna look like over the next 10 or 15 years, or what services are available to the community. So there, there are limitless possibilities, but I think government and local officials have the, the power and the opportunity to really use their power to convene people in a structure that is collaborative, not that is not hierarchical. So there needs to be a buy-in for citizens and community activists. Absolutely, absolutely. Anita, what role should institutions play? <clears throat> oh, what role should institutions play? That's a, uh, a loaded question. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I, I believe that it's, that's a loaded question is because um, I think that institutions are, are mission-driven. Uh, some institutions forget what mission they have and they go after taking care of all the other things except for the mission that they were asked to, or that they had designed for them. And so uh, I firmly believe that if you're a mission-driven institution that you stay with your mission. There are many, over the past history, there's many organizations that have made decisions based on their mission. They did not have to question whether this decision was the right one or the wrong one. They used their mission in order to make that decision, and they've lived with that. And I look at Johnson & Johnson and how they solved the Tylenol problem. They removed the Tylenol from the shelves. They took care of their family and their, their employees and the people that they serve. They didn't question it. That was part of their mission. So I go back to it's very important to address and understand what that mission is and stick with it. Right. That's a good point right there. I want to switch gears here and discuss how our programs at Claremont Lincoln University prepare leaders, uh, future leaders, practitioners, and students uh, to build bridges, to fight racial injustice, and support community uh, dialogue. Victor, uh, how does the Claremont Corps, I want to start with you, how does the Claremont Corps uh, prepare students to take that mindful approach uh, when engaging racial and culturally sensitive issues? Right. I, the Claremont Corps, I think, is, is obviously is the core of our university. Right. And what we, are, what we are doing is helping students, as uh, Stan mentioned earlier, to develop some awareness mm -hmm. uh, of oneself to develop some compassion for others in order to engage others in positive change. And we do that through four courses that we offer. And all of our students, no matter what degree they're getting, have to take these four courses in the Claremont Corps, which are mindfulness, dialogue, collaboration, and change. And so in each course, students are going to come away with revolutionary skills. I like that. Absolutely. Revolutionary skills. So they'll be able to, for example, in the mindfulness course, to identify their own personal stress pattern responses and how to overcome them, to apply a mindful practice in their personal and professional settings. And from this mindful practice, be able to develop compassion and compassionate responses not only to individuals that they may be interacting with, maybe difficult persons that we've all had to deal with at right. some point or time, difficult situations that we've all been in. How do we, students will be able to come away with the skills to help them to address those types of issues. In dialogue, students are gonna be able to come away with the ability to be active listeners, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, we know how it is when we're talking to people that we can fake like we're listening, but we're not really listening, right? right? We're, taught, we're thinking about what we're gonna say next. And so active listening is really a skill that people have to develop to say, I'm present with you and I'm, listen I'm really listening to what you're saying. 
Um, and from those active listening skills, you students will be able to foster skill, develop skills to help them foster dialogue. Because you can't dialogue unless you listen well. And then that will help students to be able to create uh, uh, a space for shared understanding, options, and action for mutual benefit, which leads us then to collaboration course. When we talk about power and privilege. We talk about how to identify and engage stakeholders and to create conditions for stakeholders, for people to come together to engage in effective collaboration. And then finally, in our change course, we talk about the elements of change as they impact change, to analyze practices that, uh, and skills that students need to develop to be agents of change. What do you need to take, a, in order to change things, what skills do you need? And to develop approaches to creating visibility and generating insight for change. And then giving them the ability to actually formulate, strategize, and in a systematic way, be able to engage in change activities. That's pretty powerful, taking ownership of social change. Absolutely. Not only just yeah. being in the moment, but taking ownership of right. it. Uh, uh, Stan, I want to turn to you uh, and ask about the MA in Ethical Leadership program. Uh, how is that program uh, preparing students to promote social change? And also tell us a little bit about the capstone as well. Thank you for asking. The MA in Ethical Leadership starts where students at the same time they're taking the mindfulness class that Victor mentioned they are going to be in a professional assessment class that involves personal assessment as well, where they have to come away with a strong sense of what those values are that guides them. And as Anita alluded to, what's their mission? What mission do they envision for themselves and for the organizations that they lead? And then as we move into the next term, we do leadership literacy. And those classes, we're going to look at models uh, for simply getting stuff done, the pragmatic side of leadership. But we're also going to look at models like transformational leadership, which is asking the question, how do we get followers to internalize values and be transformed we're better by that? We'll look at models like urban urban leadership. We'll also look at followership, which is a wonderful model. And again, goes to this issue of mission. Followership basically says we're going to keep the purpose of the organization at the center of the leader-follower relationship. And yes, leaders will be holding followers accountable for that relationship or the, the, the mission, but courageous followers also have every right to stand up to those leaders and hold them accountable for mission and purpose. And, and our courses uh, continue to sort of build and reflect on principles from there as we look at issues related to culture, globalization, and, and issues related to the shadow sides of leadership. Now, to the issue of the Capstone Action Program, <laughs> that's a chance for us to see these uh, core concepts that Victor talked about and see them apply. And so the way that works is in mindfulness, we, we teach our students how to identify those values, to be mindful and aware of their circumstances, to see the gap between the value and the circumstance and begin to consider how to address that gap. Dialogue is about coming into that situation and saying, okay, am I the only one who sees this? And let me make sure my uh, perspective is skewed, that, that I need to be mindfully aware of my biases. The way I check that is by having dialogue with other people who are in this context as well as consulting scholars and experts in this area to see how they've addressed the problem. And then we move into collaboration, which is where we work with other people to identify the ways that we can address the problem as a group, not simply by ourselves, uh, to address what our goals should be, what are the methods for addressing the situation, how will we measure or recognize success. And then we move into change, which is actually carrying all that out um, but it also gives us space for reflection and analysis right. so that we can, uh, again, apply mindfulness, be aware of our context, be aware of our values, 
let's see what's changed, and then we start this action and reflection cycle again. Thank you so much, Stan. Will, you mentioned earlier uh, faith leaders and faith-based organizations uh, putting their beliefs into action. Uh, as a faculty member of the MA and Interfaith Action Program, how are, uh, well, how is the, the, the MIFA program uh, training students to become interfaith leaders in the 21st century? We have some amazing students in MIFA, and they get an interfaith background and a chance to practice multi-faith sensibility to be able to navigate around the major pitfalls of working with diverse people, trying to move their communities forward. A lot of that is centered around becoming a non-anxious presence in tense situations. They're provided with the academic theory and the change-making models to help their communities think strategically to take action that benefits the least of these and those left behind in their settings. And sometimes these are interfaith, and sometimes these are more secular communities, sometimes they're on campuses, but it's always in working together to bring around a living wage or address systemic racism, to think about jobs and shelter and food security concerns, learning how to bring diverse people together to address such projects together and being able to live into that present moment and help move a process forward is, is some of the great skills that our MIFAs do. Thanks. Well, thank you, Will. Uh, Anita, you've worked around the world. You've had a chance to work with students uh, in South Africa and also Guyana. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience working with these students in Africa and how the MA and social impact uh, transforms lives. Well, let me start with Nelson Mandela because the na name of the program that I worked with was called the Mandela Washington Fellow Young African Leaders. And Mandela's philosophy of leadership was collaboration. And he believed that the importance of every human being. So as uh, was pointed out earlier, Stan, you even you mentioned, if there is a problem or if there is uh, a major non-peace going on in one area and yet peace in the other, that it's the non-peace, it's that, pro that problem area that is all of our problem. And uh, Stan, you also pointed out that awareness and desire was something that was real, real important. And in the Mandela Washington Fellows Young African Leaders, this is a program that was established by Obama. He believed in, in training the next generation of leaders in Africa to give them the skills that they need to either be entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial to be civic-minded and to be leaders in their own community. And I was privileged to teach that, uh, pro in that program for two years. And I'm bringing that kind of experience and that kind of understanding of, of uh, leadership and, and the philosophy that Mandela uh, believes in. I'm bringing that into the program. And one of the most important things that we are, are sharing with the students is how to become more entrepreneurial in your thinking. Does it mean that you start a business? It means that you are looking at new and more creative ways to solve these problems, that you're going to become visionaries. You're going to learn how to implement, and you're going to learn how to collaborate, and you're going to learn how to develop sustainability so that these uh, the, the effect of change can continue on. That's a good point. Well, let's go around the room, uh, around the table. <laughs> Final <laughs> thoughts. Uh, take 20 seconds. Uh, starting with you, Victor, uh, what is needed to improve race relations in the U.S.? Well, Daryl, another loaded question, but hey, uh, I'll give it a shot. Mm. I, I, I really think, from my point of view, what, what we need is really the ability to, for each and every one of us, to develop our self-knowledge, to understand ourselves if we want change. And I've asked my students over my over 15 years of, of teaching at a university, every time I have them in class, and I say, how many of you want to change things? And they all raise their hand. Right. So I, I, I think it's universal that, that people like us 
There are many people out there that want to change things. If you want to change, you have to know yourself. Right. You have to use that knowledge to be able to understand others and to understand that we're all in the same boat. We're all working and struggling for that change to improve our lives for ourselves and for our families and our communities. And that, um, and that we can take that passion and compassion mm -hmm. and really engage others for change. So That's what we need to do. And that works on, on, on all problems, but even specifically when it comes to race because it's such an entrenched um, institutional issue in our country. And it, it, it won't change by electing new people. It'll mm -hmm. only change when we decide and come together to change it ourselves. That's a good point. Stan? I come back to awareness and desire. On the individual level, am I aware of what's going on in my community? What am I, what am I doing to become aware? How am I in engaging my community outside of my immediate neighborhood? And then desire, what do I desire to do about that? But again, leadership is not a solo act. It's a community act. It requires a collaboration. And so how do I connect with other people who are aware and see this issue and also have a desire to act on it? That's a good point. Will? I think cultural humility is where things begin. And I do think that we need to think strategically and to share our own privilege in a shared leadership model with others and to follow the lead even if it means that there's some costly restitution. We're, we're seeing San Francisco become a more white city and county than any of the other counties in the Bay Area. And part of that is African Americans moving out of the Fillmore, Hispanic Americans moving out of the Mission, and a really increased rate of gentrification. And that affects all of our communities throughout the Bay Area as people that don't make enough money to live to be able to afford housing get pushed further and further from their jobs. Thank you. Anita. Well, President Obama was quoted as saying that discrimination is in our DNA. Mm. And a simple policy is not going to remove white supremacy from our collective psyches. It's going to need and take creative responses. And many people will say, I don't have any creativity. Well, that's not true. Everyone does. And what we want to do and what I believe in this program is that we are helping bring out the, the creativity and the new responses to some of these old problems and that we begin to address them and send these people out in our change makers, send them out and to affect change in, in their communities. That's a great point. I want to thank the uh, guests today here on the Digital Roundtable, those of you all who are in the studio and our friends. Uh, in cyberspace who had a chance to join us today. Stan, Will, Anita, and Victor, thank you so much. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us um, for this Digital Roundtable on bridging, uh, building bridges, race, leadership, and social justice in the 21st century. We invite you to bring these ideas to your uh, community so that we can begin to build a society together. Uh, feel free to visit us at claremontlincolnuniversity.org uh, to learn more about ways we are training future leaders to make radical changes in society. Thank you so much.